thankful, Father, for this world. Beautiful trees and grass, green grass, and it's just amazing, Father, that one would not know that there's a God for the beauty that we have here in this world. We praise you, Father, and give you all honor and glory to your name. We ask, Father, that you leave those who are sick and bring them back to their health if it be thy will. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you remember, uh, if you go, going all the way back to the reason that Paul left Timothy uh, in Ephesus, uh, we placed a lot of emphasis on the first chapter, as Paul does, upon the correction of errors and making sure that people are not uh, falling for uh, these uh, fables and genealogies that uh, someone is pushing in, in the church there in Ephesus. Uh, when you get to chapter 2, he kind of broadens the scope of Timothy's work. If you, if you look at chapter 3 and you look at verse 15, there's a real nice little uh, summation, I think, of the, the general thing that, that Paul is concerned about Timothy's work there when he says, If I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. I don't think what he's telling Timothy there is you, you need to know how to act personally. I, I think what the, the better idea, at least the idea that I think is more in keeping with the context, is uh, how to do the work of an evangelist that I've left you there to do. And so not only does the work in chapter 1 involve uh, addressing things that are that, that are being taught in error, but as you looked at last week in chapter 2, this idea of looking to God's direction and the prayers that are necessary uh, that, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life uh, and, and that we might be conscious of our roles. And uh, I know y'all talked about this, not my aim to revisit it and start the conversation over again. Uh, it, it is difficult to determine, is he talking about just general? Is he talking about worship? Uh, and, and I think there's probably applications to both things in regards to uh, the, the, the instruction he makes to men and to women. Uh, you, you also have to remember anytime you have those kind of gender-related directions, they live in a very different culture than we live. And Christianity... Uh, introduced a, a code, a standard that God had intended in creation that had been completely lost in Grecian culture, uh, in, in many ways completely lost. And for Christians coming out of the culture and uh, being introduced to a couple of very significant concepts, uh, once again, God's roles for gender identity. And Paul addresses this, 1 Corinthians 11 as well, uh, as he does here with Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, but, but not only gender roles in general, but, but the idea of liberty, uh, which almost kind of contradict one another. Uh, Paul mentioned several times uh, to the Colossian, uh, Colossians, the Galatians both, uh, that uh, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. And, and I think that those concepts sometimes probably cause some confusion in a congregation uh, if, you're a, if you're a slave, are you now equal to your master on a social level? Uh, does my becoming a Christian change that relationship? And I think probably the same is true with male and female. Uh, now that I've become a Christian, especially for a woman who may have been granted some kind of spiritual gift, uh, does that change my relationship with the men? Does that change how I'm supposed to conduct myself outside of services, inside of services. So I think in many ways what you see going on, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapters uh, uh, probably 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, it, it is, is somewhat parallel to what you find in chapter 2. When you get to chapter 3, where we are now, we are probably and arguably the, the most familiar section in the first letter to Timothy, uh, as he's going to talk about elders and deacons, okay? Uh, we are very familiar with, with uh, the things that are said here because from time to time, these become very practical for our congregation. And, and it has been for us as we've just kind of gone through some of this 
a process of selecting and uh, looking at uh, those men who, who we would put forth to lead us. And so the, the reason I'm kind of summarizing this is I want you to see what Paul's doing with Timothy. I'm leaving you at this congregation. It's a well-established church already. They already have elders. They already have deacons. Uh, Paul himself was there for a couple of years at one point. Uh, and yet, local congregational work over time demands we have to be careful about what's being taught. We have to make sure as new people are converted or as people grow, as our young people grow and, and take part in the congregation, as men, as women, does everybody understand what our roles are, how we are supposed to act, uh, and as we go forward in regards to choosing leaders. And so that's kind of where we are now. And that's why I mentioned in the introduction to Timothy and Titus, because basically Titus is the same instructions to Titus in Crete as Paul is giving to Timothy in Ephesus. Uh, here's the, here are the things in local congregational work that you as an evangelist really need to be focusing on and paying attention to, okay? So that kind of, hopefully for you, ties that all together. I think it's important that we not just separate all these different topics as if they are unrelated. This is what local congregational work is about, uh, especially from an evangelist standpoint. So we get to chapter 3 and, and beginning in verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop uh, or an overseer, he desires a good work. Uh, an overseer, a bishop, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence, for if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony, uh, testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a uh, pure conscience. But let these also first be proved. Then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Likewise, their wives. And, and I don't think any modern translation reads this way, but it would be a legitimate rendering if it said, likewise, the women. And we'll talk about that when we get to that passage. Uh, must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, pillar and ground of the truth. Let's stop right there because I do think he kind of starts shifting gears then with the next verse. Okay. Uh, one of the reasons... Paul leaves Timothy in Ephesus, and I, here's a can of worms, uh, it is to make sure that uh, proper elders are placed in the role of overseership in Ephesus. And, and I want to point out at the very beginning the first line in the first verse. What does he say at the very beginning? Back up. The first line. This is a faithful saying. Uh, it, it, it would be similar, actually, if you backed up to chapter uh, 1. Uh, and uh, where is it? Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exception. We're going to run across this two or three times in Timothy. Uh, you run across it uh, once or twice in a couple of the later letters that Paul writes, and, and, and I want you to appreciate the significance of that. Uh, I think the older versions, maybe the... Is anybody reading the old King James? Uh, huh? A true saying, or this... Sometimes it's this testimony is true. Uh, it appears to be, and this is what most uh, scholars think, I think it's probably a likely consideration... 
it, it appears that as the, the, the third, fourth, fifth decade uh, has passed since Christianity first spread into the world, that these groups of churches, these, uh, the brethren here and there and everywhere, um, they would have had hymns that they typically sang as a part of their worship. They probably would have had, uh, I, I don't know that they would have had necessarily a standardized uh, sermon, but you can find records of some of the things that were typically taught. Uh, and, and I think that they probably had a collection of kind of proverbs, pithy sayings, and, and that's what this is referring to. Some kind of statement that was known among Christians all over the brotherhood in their various congregations that were small expressions of truth that would have been used regularly. Now, we are not prone to that. But in a culture that was very orally focused in regards to teaching, we are very visually focused, but they would have been very orally focused. Proverbs and adages and wise sayings and, and pithy reminders were things that were repeated regularly because they helped you to remember. And so anytime you run into Paul's writing where he says, this is a faithful saying, or if you're in verse 16, uh, without controversy, same, same kind of deal. Here's a statement that the churches would have used regularly. Uh, if a man desires the overseership, he desires a good work. And it's interesting that that's placed by Paul on the same level as chapter 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And I'm not sure that we always necessarily place the, the appointment of elders on the same level uh, of import as this idea of, of a fundamental doctrinal belief upon which our faith is grounded. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But I want you to appreciate that that's exactly what Paul does with this passage. Uh, if you look back over time, uh, historically, th there have been more issues and more problems in local congregations because of overseers and preachers than probably any other source of difficulty in churches. Okay? And, and I think what Paul's trying to underscore with this statement, and, I, and I'm emphasizing this very intentionally because very often the first thing we do is go, okay, he's got to want the work. No, the first thing we have to do is recognize how important this is. And I think that's what Paul's doing with Timothy. Now, now here's the interesting thing about this whole section. Uh, do you believe that Timothy was inspired? Inspired in the sense that, that God gave him the things that he was to teach? Do, do you believe that? I'm getting lots of, uh, I'm not sure. Have you ever thought about that? You know, when I go in meetings... Uh, where I've never preached before, and I ask questions, people just look at me. And they don't, they don't reply or respond whatsoever, and it drives me nuts, okay? I have been here for 31 years. Please at least nod your head one way or the other. Uh, do what? Okay, you think it's implied, Dennis? <laughs> mean shake your head no I'm tired no I know I know I know I know so some of the question is do you think Timothy was inspired that that God the Spirit gave him what he needed to teach the word Phyllis you raised your hand I just did yeah that the that the Holy Spirit that 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 the prophets in the New Testament you've got Ephesians 4 uh, God gave some of the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Or 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14. Some people in local congregations, God gave the ability to know God's will and to, and to proclaim it even though they were not people educated. Okay, so uh, maybe I should ask it this way. Do you believe that Timothy was a New Testament prophet? 
Okay, I'm getting a couple of yeses, and, and, and i tell you what I'm sensing is, well, maybe I hadn't thought about that, and I'm not really sure about that. Uh, there's a couple of different passages that talk about Timothy having had his hands laid, having had hands laid on him. It, we've already looked at one where the presbytery, the overseers probably in Laodicea, where, I mean Lister, where he was from, had commended him and there was some kind of a formal public ceremony where they placed their hands on him and, and commissioned him to be their representative as teaching. But Paul also mentions laying his hands on Timothy. Why is that significant? If an apostle laid their hands on you, what could they do? They could give you the ability to, to perform miracles. They could pass on what we think of as the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, nobody but the apostles could. But the apostles could do that. Uh, and by the way, if you're in a discussion, we live in a world where it very much buys into this idea that, that, that God the Spirit's doing miracles in this day and age. When the apostles died, that ability died. And the people who were given the ability by the apostles clearly had no ability to pass it on. And the argument for that is in Acts chapter 8, where Philip, who had been given this ability from the apostles back in Acts chapter 6, uh, goes to preach the gospel in Samaria, and there are people who accept the gospel, but Philip cannot give them the ability to do miracles, so Peter and John come down from Jerusalem to lay their hands on people. And that's when Simon the sorcerer tries to buy that power. So, so the argument that has to be made is when the apostles died, the ability to pass it on died, and people who claim in this day and age to be able to do those things have absolutely no scriptural authority for such. Okay, so, but the question, backing up, do you believe Timothy had that power? Uh, and, and, and I would propose yes, and let me tell you why. New Testament hasn't been fully revealed yet. If you're going to teach the gospel in a church in the first century where all you have scripturally the Old Testament, how are you going to be able to, to, to reveal God's will under the New Covenant? And the only answer to that is you're either going to be educated by someone who has that knowledge, like the apostles, or God's going to give you the ability in this transition time to do the work that has to be done. And, and so I would propose to you that it is, that I, I would say very likely, in my mind I would say almost certain, but let's just say publicly, very likely that Timothy had this ability. So why does Paul give him these specific instructions about elders? Do what? Okay, one reason is for us. We've already made the point that, Paul, that, that Paul's writing a lot of this down not, not because Timothy necessarily needed it, but because Christians down the road, like us, are going to need that. There's another possible reason here. Anybody? Yes? Okay. Not, not just, you're right, not, but I would argue not just for the sake of circulation, but for Timothy's benefit. What's the big difference between Timothy and Paul? Okay, what's, the, what's another big difference between Timothy and Paul? <laughs> Paul's an apostle, Timothy's not. To have apostolic writing where you can say, God says overseers have to be this way, and here's Paul's letter to confirm it. Not only is Timothy acting by means of the direction of the Holy Spirit that he has some measure of, but he also has the authority of the apostles written down. Uh, and that's, that was preserved so that we have the authority of the apostles written down. But Timothy's deriving the same benefit that we derive. Okay? And I think that's important to, to consider. Uh, Dennis, were you want to say something else? Okay. Uh, so, this is a faithful saying. This is a very significant activity. All the congregations, Paul went around appointing overseers. Uh, and especially given the kind of culture many of these people had come out of, you know, these are not second and third generation Christians. Uh, you, you have to think, well, why would you have to tell somebody, don't appoint someone who's violent, 
uh, to this particular role? Well, because in the Greek culture, there were leaders that were violent men. I mean, just look at the Roman emperors. Okay, so there is a huge character change and distinction from the culture around them. And that's what's reflected here uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 in these characteristics that, that are offered. Okay, so appreciate those things going in. I know we want to get right to, okay, well, what about this, this, this quality and this quality and this quality? Uh, there's a bigger picture that you have to really kind of appreciate before you get there, okay? Uh, and some of these qualities, I think, are mentioned the way they're mentioned because of the culture that these people would come out of, uh, some of which we just don't have the same backgrounds that some of them would have. So, uh, does that make sense to you all? Questions? Comments? I, I don't mean to belabor the point. That's just a part of this that we just run over and never stop and think through. Uh, it is interesting that Paul gives this list to Timothy uh, and in some way, Timothy's responsible for making sure this gets done. Uh, I, I am not advocating that preachers appoint elders. Uh, but Paul gives Timothy this list. And Timothy's job there is to make sure this gets done properly. Okay? Uh, Steph, did, you have, did I see your hand? Yeah, I think it's very, and we talked about this a little bit back in chapter one, I think it's very possible that, that inspired men had been given some knowledge about what Timothy potentially could do, or just insightful men who were teachers saw in Timothy something that, that, was, that was special, okay? I saw another hand. No, oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, Christianity is changing the world, and, and, it, and he's in a culture where many of these things would be counterintuitive to the way things were done. And I think that's part of the reason that, that, that you have the things said in chapter 2. Some of the things said in chapter 3, uh, without getting uh, completely on this point, I think that's part of the, one, the, the married man thing, a husband of one wife. But start off at the, end, at the, the place we generally start in verse 1, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Let me suggest to you, first of all, bishop is overseer. Uh, it is an unfortunate translation. The word is episkopos, and literally in Greek it means one who watches over. Okay, bishop has been a traditional word that translates that Greek word, but in our religious culture, especially with the influence of some of the ancient Christian traditions, Catholicism, uh, the Orthodox religion, the Anglican, all of these that are kind of close to Catholicism, bishop carries a whole different meaning. Okay, But the word is overseer. There are three words in the New Testament that describe this particular work. And, and they all describe the work. This chapter describes the character of the men. And the two aren't the same. You find some men that are of this character, but they're not, they're not wise in the sense of elder. That's one of the words presbyteros, uh, they are not capable or particularly skilled at, at, at keeping an eye on and helping other people. They, they just, they, you know, it's not just leadership. It is this servant mentality that is concerned for other people uh, and, and watches for their souls, as Hebrews 13 says. And that's the concept of overseer. 
Uh, and then the, the last one, which is really only used twice, Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 5, is the word shepherd. Uh, it, more often than not, it's translated uh, in a verb form, and, and it can be uh, tend to or feed the flock. Uh, but it's the word poimen, and it is used uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5 when Peter writes to the overseers among the churches he's writing to, to shepherd the flock. And so all of these functions overseer, elder, uh, uh, shepherd, have to do with the task of looking at God's people and helping God's people serve God. Okay, It's not business management. Uh, it, it's not hyper-organization. The work is people. And, and, and so that's what Paul's telling Timothy. If someone desires to do this, and, and the word... A position of a bishop, the old version said office of a bishop. Uh, how does the, how do the ESV, ASV? Okay. The, the best translation is overseership. <laughs> and, and it simply means someone who desires to do this. And not everybody desires to do it. It, it is a very uh, selfless work. It is a very taxing work. It requires constant consideration of other people. It, it, is a, it is a work that requires constant effort. Uh, it, it is a very tasking role to be served among God's people. Okay, It's not a, an honorarium. It's not a, 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 a place of superiority. Uh, read 1 Peter chapter 5 and Peter makes that very, very clear. You're not supposed to be lords, you're supposed to shepherd, you're supposed to be example, you're supposed to lead, you're supposed to watch. Okay? So, whoever desires this particular work, uh, what he says is, you, what, what you desire is a really necessary, beneficial, profitable thing among God's people, and, and we need it. But I want you to notice that some people are not capable of the work just by virtue of their personalities. Some people aren't qualified for the work by virtue of their character, which he's about to talk about. Uh, and some people aren't qualified for the work because that's just not something that they desire to do. And all those things are important. So that's where he starts. Uh, and then we're, we're more familiar with the verses that follow. Uh, an overseer has to be blameless. This may be a general word that covers all the rest of them, and it may just be another in, in the list. I would say these are not suggestions. These are demands. You, you can't underrate them. You can't, it's, it, we don't have the right to change God's word and say, well, you know, it says not given to anger. Uh, man, he's given to anger, but he controls it pretty good. Okay, is he given to anger or not given to anger? I mean, there's judgment involved here, but it is a very, very strict set of characteristics that God gives, and we have to be careful with them. And so, blameless. Can you find anything in the man that's worth criticizing? Uh, now, I'm saying, on an honest level, not somebody with a grudge, not somebody with an axe to grind. If you've got an axe to grind, you can always blame something. But, that, but the idea is just in general, when you look at the man, is he blameless? Husband of one wife, and this is one we always get hung up on. Uh, there, there's one very clear meaning, and it means it is that he needs to be a married man. Okay? Uh, that's a given. Th then once you get beyond that is, well, why does it say husband of one wife? Well, I think there are two probable reasons. One is polygamy was much more common in the Roman era... Even among Jews in Jesus' time, polygamy was much more common than sometimes we want to acknowledge. Okay? So it was not, it would not have been unusual for someone to, to obey the gospel who, who had more than one wife. It's never sanctioned anywhere. It's very clear the teaching about divorce and remarriage. But let's argue somebody becomes a Christian who's had several wives. Is he qualified? He said, well, he's put away all these others. Now he's the husband of one wife. I would think that, that's, that, 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 that now you're on kind of fuzzy ground. Uh, so one thing I think he's addressing is polygamy. And the other thing I think he's addressing is the commonality of divorce and remarriage. Uh, 
The woman at the well. Jesus said, go get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. And what was Jesus' reply? Huh? Because you've what? You've had five husbands. Okay, did God recognize all those marriages? Well, that's not the point that's being stated. The point is, here's a woman that would have lived in some measure in accordance with the, the standards of the day of the old law, and she's been married five times. Okay, and Jesus basically says, I don't recognize those marriages. Uh, you look at uh, Roman leadership, uh, Greek leadership, uh, Jewish leadership, and, and marriage and divorce was so common, it, it's, it's just crazy. I've, I've got a quote I wanted to read. Uh, I was looking over it again this morning. Uh, okay, this, this, is, uh, this is a bit lengthy, okay, but uh, pardon me, I want you to get the concept. Uh, in its context here, we can be quite certain that the phrase means that the Christian leader must be a loyal husband preserving marriage in all its purity. We may well ask why it should be necessary to lay down what, was, uh, what looks obvious. It must be understood that the state, of the, world in which was the, uh, the state of the world in which this was written, it's been said and with much truth that the only totally new virtue which Christianity brought into this world was chastity. In many ways, the ancient world was in a state of moral chaos, even the Jewish world. Astonishing as it may seem, certain Jews still practiced polygamy. Apart altogether from these unusual cases, divorce was tragically easy in the Jewish world. Marriage was indeed the ideal, but divorce was permitted. The Jews held that once the marriage ideal had been shattered by, listen, cruelty or infidelity or incompatibility. It was far better to allow a divorce and permit the two to make a fresh start. In the case of divorce by consent in the time of the New Testament, all that was required was two witnesses and no court case at all. A husband could send his wife away for any cause. At the most, a wife could petition the court to urge her husband to write her a bill of divorcement, but it could not compel him even to do that. In the heathen world, things were infinitely worse. Things grew so bad and marriage grew so irksome that in 131 B.C., a well-known Roman called Metellus Macedonius made a statement which Augustus has afterwards to quote, and this will be familiar to you. If we could do without wives, we would be rid of that nuisance, but since nature has decreed that we can neither live comfortably with them nor live at all without them, we must look rather to our permanent interests than to passing pleasure. Now understand... Basically, the, you can't live them with them, you can't live without them. That's where it's familiar. 131 B.C., written by a very prominent statesman, quoted by other statesmen. Tacitus commended the supposedly barbarian German tribes for not laughing at evil and not making seduction the spirit of the age. The happy marriage was the astonishing exception. Ovid and Pliny had three wives. Caesar, this would be Julius. And Antony had four. Sulla and Pompey had five. Herod, this would be Herod the Great, had nine wives. Cicero's daughter, Tullia, had three husbands. The emperor Nero was the third husband of Popeia and the fifth husband of Statilla Messalina. It was not for nothing that the pastor laid it down and that a Christian leader must be the husband of one wife. In a world where even the highest places were deluged with immorality, the Christian church must demonstrate the chastity, stability, and sanctity of the home. You know, we, we make arguments about one wife uh, uh, when, when we're dealing with assigning and appointing new overseers. We, are, we have no idea what those folks had to deal with, okay? And so when you read this, you need to remember that Paul is, uh, God is correcting thousands of years of complete dismissal of divine truth, okay? So keep that in mind next time you're making some big argument about, well, husband of one wife, you know, his wife died and now he's married again, so now he's been the husband of two wives. Please understand what it is that God's trying to get Timothy to recognize. You've got people that have obeyed the gospel, but their lives prior to becoming Christians was in no way exemplary of what a husband and a father should show in their home, okay? 
So, uh, temperate uh, just, just carries the idea of uh, circumspect, of sober-minded, of serious-minded. Uh, uh, sober-minded, uh, which you would think, well, that's the same, uh, that's the same concept, uh, is, is addressing the idea of prudent or discreet, okay? Not just controlled. Uh, of good behavior, uh, orderly. This is the same word, by the way, that's used back in chapter 2, in verse 9, where it says that women are to adorn themselves in modest apparel. This is not shamefaced. Shamefaced is in that ver- word, in that verse. Uh, this is orderly, self-controlled, wise, uh, manifesting a good consideration for appearance. Uh, given to hospitality, you know, and if a holiday inn everywhere, there were inns, you probably didn't want to stay in them. And in a day where Christians were being increasingly targeted by Romans and by Roman culture, the idea that brethren would take care of one another, watch out for one another, especially if they were traveling, was absolutely vital for their safety, and the people taking the lead in that uh, had, had to be had to be the the overseers. You know, we think of hospitality now as what? Yeah, having somebody over to eat, having somebody in your home, and and, and there is a there is a connection, but this is a much deeper. This is opening your home uh, to, to, a, to, a, to a stranger, to a traveler. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, able to teach. Uh, now, when you get to Titus account, Titus chapter 1, Paul puts great emphasis on this in, to Titus. Titus is in Crete, and clearly you do not have a congregation or congregations in Crete that are perhaps as spiritually mature as you have in Ephesus. Even though... Acts chapter 20, the Ephesian elders had been told that false teachers would arise among them. So why is it so important for an elder to be able to teach? Well, he doesn't simply mean can he get up and do a lesson on what do I need to do to be saved. If you turn over to Titus chapter 1, I think you have a better understanding where he says in verse 10 or verse 9, uh, speaking again of elders, and notice by the way, uh, to Titus, he uses the word elder. To Timothy, he uses the word overseer. They are the same. Uh, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and convict those who contradict. There are many insubordinate, idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things that they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Uh, whose job is it to make sure false teachers don't come in and subvert the church? Well, Paul tells Timothy to do it, but Paul also says this is something elders have to be able to do. Okay, uh, So you, you see that connection between Timothy and Titus. Able to teach, not given to wine, and you go, wait a minute, they weren't supposed to be drinking. C- come on, let's be honest for a minute. Most water in that age was undrinkable. All right? The common drink that everyone drank was diluted wine because it was safe. And the literal meaning of this is not sitting long at the wine. What you drank with a meal, you had to drink a bunch of to get drunk. Okay, so did they drink alcohol? Yes, but it was so diluted that drunkenness demanded absolute uh, indulgence. Okay? And that's what he means is don't take what is permissible and indulge in it to the point that you lose your reason. Uh, so uh, not given to wine. And by the way, I don't think that this lends credit to the idea that we ought to be able to drink as Christians in this day and age. Totally different thing. And, and I'll be honest with you, there is absolutely nothing about drinking alcohol that, that brings any advantage to you as a Christian. Okay, when, when you can show me where alcohol helps me to, be, to serve God better, then we can open the door to that discussion. But the honest truth is, there is nothing about alcohol that's not used medicinally that makes me more self-controlled or that helps me as a child of God. All it's going to do is ruin my influence and expose me to an addiction that I may never get over. If you don't believe that, talk to people who've been alcoholics. Okay, Ken, you want to say something? Say that again. 
diluted. Yeah. Yeah, fresh grape juice. Yes. Yeah. But it could also include highly alcoholic. Yeah, it was a very general word. You're all right. Yeah. Uh, from what historically I've been able to gather, generally it was three parts wine to two part water. Okay? And the wine may or may not have been at, at some varying degree of alcoholic content. Now, they also had strong drink, which is mentioned, which would be more like what we would think of as distilled alcohol. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, the fact that they use this as a part of their culture doesn't justify what happens in our culture. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, I would think that that just makes common sense. And, and, if, and if you think that that doesn't have any impact, I had a friend in college that tried to argue, I think it's okay to drink alcohol. And, and I said, have you ever tried to have a Bible study with a non-Christian while y'all were drinking? And he said, no, I don't. And I said, how do you think that would go? He said, well, if the Bible study lasted very long and if there was very much drinking going on, there wasn't going to be very much studying going on for very long. For one thing, it doesn't take very long uh, for alcohol to start affecting the way you think. And how are you going to argue about influence? How are you going to argue about self-control? And, and, and so I, I don't mean to get off on this. I just, let's be reasonable is, is wine wine in the Bible? Yes, it is. Even the apostles were accused in Acts chapter 2 of being drunk. And Peter's reply to that was what? Huh? It's just 9 o'clock in the morning. What are you talking about? We couldn't be sitting around drinking long enough to get drunk at this point in the day. He doesn't say, hey, I don't drink alcohol. Okay? Paul does caution Timothy later on, take a little wine for your stomach's sake. So there were medicinal uses. So I just want you to be reasonable. You know, it's not reasonable to say the Bible says you can't ever take a drink of alcohol. It's not what the Bible says. But the Bible does caution us and paint a poor picture, especially in the Proverbs. And I don't believe what you find is Christians in the first century drinking the way that we see drinking done in our day and age. Uh, and we can talk about that more at a later date. Uh, but that's the idea of here's a leader... He's not given to wine. He's not sitting long at the wine, I think, is, is the, if I remember right, is the literal rendering. Uh, not violent, once again. Do you have to say that? Well, in that culture, you did. Okay, not violent, not greedy for money. Now, here's one that spans every culture. Okay, people that are just money is their life and their life is money have no business leading God's people. Why? Why is this such a big deal? Where's our treasure? If our leader's treasure's not in heaven, how's our treasure going to be in heaven? Okay, not greedy for money, uh, not, uh, but, but gentle, and I hear the positive things. Uh, gentle is, is an interesting word. It, it basically means... Uh, uh, some, some translate it patient. It, it really means kind of yielding. So, someone who, who's not constantly pushing their way as the only way is really the idea here. Uh, gentle, uh, where are we? Not quarrelsome. Someone who's not always just looking for an argument. Uh, not covetous. This goes with the greed. And, and sometimes it's money, sometimes it's just the desire to have what I don't have. Uh, and then verse 4 and 5, one who rules his own house well. Let me, we'll stop. Was that the second bell? Why do I keep missing the first bell? It's got to be like, you know, something psychological. Okay, we'll pick up with the, the elder in his home Wednesday night, okay? And we will probably finish this chapter Wednesday night. So please take note of that, all right?